That's all I have. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next, I would call on Senator Diane Savino. Thank you, Senator Young. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, the beauty of going this far into the testimony is a lot of the questions I had had already been answered. But I want you to clarify for me something. In your testimony, you mentioned that the governor has uh, given your agency $50 million to enhance DOT's capabilities with respect to win um, purchase of winter storm equipment so that your agency can respond better to harsh winter conditions. But yet in the uh, Chips Marchicelli budget, which is remaining flat, there's also no additional money this year for harsh winter weather conditions. So are you suggesting that the state will be responsible for helping localities, or how are localities supposed to absorb well, the, the increased costs? Yeah, the harsh winter funding that was done last year, I believe, mm -hmm. was really in response to what was, if we all recall, the vortexes, you know, that took place. Really extreme, harsh winter weather. Unfortunately, this year, we haven't seen that yet. Um, but there is going to be an increase for folks. You're correct. Uh, Chips and Marshall are staying the same. But I mentioned the PAVE New York program. That is an increase. And so when you couple that increase with the chips that's held at the same level and the Marcielli, which is used to match for mm -hmm. those federal programs, they will see an increase. Okay, so now let me go back to something more local. You know, we're all very parochial here. Uh, Senator, uh, Assemblyman Cusick talked a bit about the Staten Island Expressway. Right. And while it seems to be largely completed, uh, and by the way, it has made you know, things much better for Staten Islanders, assuming there's no problems on the other side of the bridge. One of the things, though, with the HOV lane is the abuse of it. So uh, obviously there has to be coordination with the NYPD and the highway division to have greater enforcement on the HOV lane so that people don't abuse it. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways you avoid that on the Brooklyn side of it is there's a Jersey barrier that prevents people from getting into it once the, once the HOV lane starts. Right. So has there been any consideration about putting a Jersey barrier down, the SIE, to make sure that people cannot abuse it? Um, I haven't had that conversation, but I will. I'll have that with City DOT. I mentioned earlier I was having discussions with them on the Gowanus now because, mm -hmm. you know, at some point certain, you know, we transfer it over to them and they'll be responsible for that. But I will have that conversation with them. Yeah, because it's incredibly frustrating to Staten yeah. Islanders well, to see I'm sure it people is routinely abuse the, uh, the HOV lane with impunity. Now, right. with respect to the Gowanus Expressway, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked your predecessor, Joan McDonald. Uh, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in improving the Staten Island Expressway. Uh, the MTA is spending, you know, untold amounts of money on redecking the Verrazano Bridge. They're also about to embark on a new plan to revamp the, uh, the entrance of the exit ramps, particularly the connections to the Belt Parkway, which is going to create a significant amount of uh, traffic congestion on the, on the Gowanus Expressway. But we've invested tens of millions, millions and millions of dollars on the Gowanus Expressway and the BQE over the past, I don't know, 30 years. We've never added any capacity to it. Well, so we, are, we, we have not added any capacity to it. Right. It is the same, you know, roadway, roadway that it always has been. <clears throat> and that is what creates the backup. So if you have one accident on the BQE or one accident on the Gowanus, it's backed up all the way either to Queens or it's backed up all the way to New Jersey. Same bottlenecks every day, the split where the battery tunnel, where you go this way to the battery tunnel or this way to the BQE, same tie-ups every day, the same tie-ups at the Kosciuszko Bridge. So unless we're prepared to either eliminate the Gowanus and, re and build something else or, or to add capacity to it, how are we supposed to improve transit through this region? Well, that's a great question. And I mean, and ca <laughs> candidly, there's a ton of traffic there, as you know. Um, and that complicates things because you've got a defined roadway that was built whenever it was built, um, and there's more traffic than that roadway was designed for because there's more people than it was designed for back then. Um, you know, to talk about how you, uh, frankly, add on or build new uh, is a, is a long-term conversation because it's going to take a great deal of resources. Um, involves right-of-way, which is always uh, kind of a sticky issue mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, securing properties to either expand or create a new footprint. Um, but we're challenged, of course, with the high number of users on that roadway. It kind of is what it is. That doesn't minimize it, but it's just the fact of the matter. And so that's why the HOV uh, lane was added. I think it's worked very well. 
uh, but I understand that there's still challenges. I know accidents create big choke points. They're problematic mm -hmm. because then everything bottlenecks, and it's a result of all the traffic that I just described. Um, so, uh, you know, candidly, I don't have an answer for you to say how are you going to fix that. Um, it's a long-term discussion, though. If, mm -hmm. if people are interested in how you add on or build new, um, that's a federal highway long-term discussion that will need to take place. Well, candidly, those discussions have been taking place for years. When I first got elected, yeah. there was a, uh, and I'm sure Assemblywoman Simon will also speak about this, sure. there was uh, studies done then, and in fact, there was a recommendation to either double-deck the Gowanus Expressway, which right. of course is something that the people in the community aren't interested in, uh, or build a tunnel. Uh, at the time, I think this was 2006, the proposed cost for a potential tunnel was about $30 billion in the time frame of uh, like 20 years to build right. it. But that, that study, those feasibility studies on how to improve traffic flow through that area, all centered around expanding capacity. Right. So we can spend another half a billion dollars redecking the Gowanus Expressway and, and still not move anybody any faster. But if you would like, I'm sure we would be happy to send you those studies. They're sitting on a shelf somewhere collecting yeah. dust. Uh, but there are some suggestions in there that I think we should look at, because if not, we are going to have the same choke bottlenecks everywhere, which is a disincentive to people to bring their businesses to Staten Island or even to South Brooklyn. South Brooklyn is growing uh, you know, very fast. The industry city is industry city again for the first time in probably 30 years. We need to be able to move people and goods and services through that area much quicker than we're doing now. Right, understood. And I would like to see those, and I know my staff is from, I'm assuming my staff is familiar with these. Mm -hmm. We'll have that conversation. Um, and, you know, I'm not a big fan of continually doing studies because I don't like to see mm -hmm. studies sit on the shelf after you spend money. We're not in a position to be able to do that. I can't speak to what took place years before. I can only t tell you going forward that I'll take a look at it, but I won't make a promise to say, we're gonna add a new deck, we're going to expand it. But I will take a look at that, I'll have a conversation mm -hmm. with staff, and I'm happy to meet with the two of you if you'd like and discuss it further. Thank you. And I'll come to you. Thank you very much, Assemblyman Oaks. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here. Um, I know we've uh, talked a bit on the, the funding for bridges, state and local. Right. Um, question uh, related to that, well, one, a comment. I do think, and I heard you say there would be some local input on that, although you have a metrics that you're going to use of how you pick those. Um, do culverts qualify? I know, you, you know, in, in bridge money in a lot of our rural areas, we have culverts. They may not meet the distance, but they're also, you, you know, taking traffic. Will those qualify under this? Under the bridge program? Yeah. No, because they're not a bridge. But I did mention it's a competitive program, so a local community in your district or anyone else's would make application to the Department of Transportation you know, for potential funding. And certainly we would be asking them to provide us information relative to that bridge. And we'd utilize the bridge inspections that no doubt we've done as part of that process as well. But, but one of the thoughts I might have or whatever that we try to have a piece of funding culverts right. uh, m maybe that could go toward that and whether that be distributed on a, a chips type thing, but maybe a piece of that as we go forward Okay. because certainly those are in, in bad shape. On the pavement side, um, you mentioned that you're working on the criteria uh, for that, and we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, again, suggestion on that side that had been made to me, you know, if, if we use the local CHIPS formula, obviously on the pavement side, that would uh, be a way of meeting uh, a lot of the local needs, and at a minimum, certainly, uh, it, you know, again, having a, a great deal of local input on that uh, would would be appreciated. Um, you, we've heard the word parity often today. Uh, we've looked at uh, the numbers. Obviously, the reason I think it keeps coming up is because if you look at historically, um, I have happened to be around the legislature a number of years. We saw where 
the, it, the norm was having uh, equal funding for mass transit and our driving public, uh, trying to serve both those needs, which are both critically important to our state. Then we had fiscal crisis, uh, the state having to make tough decisions, and we saw uh, where uh, those started to see a disparity. This year we see kind of the most it has been, and so instead of coming backwards, uh, or back toward more parity, we're seeing maybe even it inching uh, further the other way. And I know you've made the comment that you feel good about the investments. It is historic. I do know there some of the industry projections are saying, you know, we're looking at 20 or 22 million if we include the throughway stabilization. Some of the industry standards are saying we ought to be spending 28 billion to meet the needs. And obviously, unlimited dollars, if we had those, I know your first instance would probably be to say, how do we, how do we get those uh, dollars there? But I, I guess, you, you know, my uh, question is, how do we get to parity? Do you have a sense, I, I know you've made comments here of, uh, you, you know, that's, you're gonna continue to be working and whatever, but is that uh, the goal, the hope, and, and how do we get there? Well, I think, you know, how we get there is doing just what the governor um, has proposed. Uh, this is uh, the largest DOT budget ever. It's $20.1 billion. And so it allows us to not only maintain, but enhance the system as well and make strategic investments that support rail and transit, um, that support local economies also. Um, so, you know, I think if we looked at it in the context of setting aside a dollar amount of what this budget can do, it can make a difference. And I'll go back to the bridge New York and the pave New York. Now, I've been um, here in my role as commissioner not quite six months, and I've taken the time to travel the state and meet with local communities, elected officials, certainly members of the legislature. And nearly everyone, uh, you know, is concerned about the dollars that can get to local level to help them support their needs, even basic needs such as paving or bridge repair. That's why those programs are in here because the governor understands it's important to get dollars to the localities who need them most. And I will say they are also being utilized as well to help support the state system because we have a responsibility to maintain and improve that as well. So I'm very comfortable with, with the budget. I think it's a very good budget. Um, I think it's moving in the right direction. It's going to deliver things that we have been unable to do in the past. Uh, and so I feel good, I feel good about the budget. I, I guess I would just uh, end with in saying, you know, I, I, the parity sense uh, that I hear and feel being uh, uh, individual whose uh, residents depend more on those roads and bridges, whether they be state or local ones each day. So there's a sense of fairness. There's also the real concern for safety and, and getting to the point where we can feel comfortable that the people who are going to work every day, getting on a school bus, uh, doing whatever, can trust the roads that we have. And I know when I talk to my local highway people, they express concerns of saying we're falling behind. Help uh, is needed in anything the state uh, can do uh, is important and so I, I come from that I I hope that maybe in the negotiations in this year's budget uh, maybe we see an opportunity to move uh, closer to that I know this is the governor's proposal uh, I also hope that as those negotiations take place uh, this year we can uh, maybe have a louder voice uh, and include the uh, uh, all the leaders among those negotiations, and maybe then we come up with the best decisions. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Patty Ritchie. Commissioner, I would just like to start off by thanking you for your responsiveness. Um, I have to say that I've been really impressed with uh, your ability and your Chief of Staff's ability to fix a number of problems that um, I brought up at the hearings over the last couple of years that for some reason couldn't get fixed and inside of a day or two once you took over um, they were addressed and have been taken care of. 
one of those problems that I've addressed over the last couple of years is one that I'm sure you're aware of, and that is the salt contamination in the wells in the town of Orleans. Um, in your previous position, you were very instrumental in helping secure that uh, low-cost loan for the town to be able to connect uh, of the water systems to those residents. And, you know, the governor this year has a clean water fund that I'm hoping because of the economic challenges in the town of Orleans that we'll finally be able to put this issue to rest and get um, good water to the people who live there. So I'm just asking if you've had an opportunity to look at it and have any suggestions. Well, let me start by thanking you for your leadership on that two years ago. Um, and uh, as you pointed out, you know, we, we brought together a large number of people uh, with your leadership as well, and we're able to construct a financial structure with some grant that at that time we thought was going to do it. Um, I've read recently that there's um, some chatter uh, about the issue. Um, what I want to say to you is, and I did speak with some of my uh, colleagues uh, just the other day, is that I'm willing to re-engage on that. Uh, and to bring the appropriate people back at the table um, so we can take a fresh look at that. So uh, I'm willing to help to the extent that I can with you on that. And I just uh, in return would like to say that this is exactly um, what I talked about at the beginning, and that your willingness to take a look at the issue. You know, this has been going on for a number of years, something that we have to have resolution to. but. Um, I'm hopeful that given the fact that you've been able to solve the other problems, um, you know, very quickly that we'll be able to get to where we need to on this also. So okay. thank you. We will um, we'll reach out to you and work to coordinate our schedules. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Assemblywoman Shelley Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good, good morning still, uh, morning. Commissioner. Uh, my questions deal with the non-MTA downstate system fundings. Uh, I represent the city of Yonkers, and um, I have some questions. Um, it appears that the operating budget for the Westchester portion of the budget is increased by 5.92 percent. Is that am I correct about that? Yeah, so about 157 million. I, I actually think it's more than that. But my question is, in determining the percentage increase for the non-MTA downstate regions, is the same percentage increase applied to each of the carrier, each of the communities? In other words, Nassau got the same percentage increase, Suffolk, same percentage increase? I don't know the answer to that, but the answer is yes. My understanding is it is yes. <laughs> so my question is, did the department do any independent analysis of the ridership trends in these counties, not pitting myself against the others, but did you do any independent analysis to say, for example, Westchester's percentage increase may be greater than another county's? We did. Okay, I'd be interested in seeing what your data shows. Would you be willing sure. to share that? Sure. Um, did you do any analysis of whether the county's contributions uh, resulted in service loss. Just for example, in Westchester over the past, uh, I would say, eight years, there's been a substantial diminution in service of the B line because the county contributed less, which I understand is not the state's problem, but is my constituents' problems because there is a uh, reduction in bus service and bus routes. Did you, did you look at uh, the actual usage and what the county's contributions have been? Yes, I know ridership counts and usage are part of that. Okay, I, again, I'd be interested in seeing that. Uh, with respect to the capital contributions for the downstate suburban uh, operators, I understand that the distribution is not confirmed or, or there's not an exact uh, understanding of where there will be capital and where it will be allocated. Right. Um, I, I just would like to make clear that for systems like ours, which is ex as the other suburban districts, uh, historically underfunded, in my opinion, based on the needs of an urban suburban community that is extremely dependent on public transportation, um, that the need for capital should be based on an independent evaluation of the need of the system. And I don't know, have you had an opp opportunity to meet with the Beeline service as you went around? Uh, I have not yet. I know we are. I am. 
you are planning to meet with them. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I would urge that there be an independent analysis of the needs of that system. And um, the other uh, question I have is with respect to uh, capital, has DOT looked at um, the needs, uh, safety needs of bus drivers and bus operators uh, in these public transit systems and whether there should be dividers between the driver and the passengers as I believe they have in the city of New York? Yeah, I, there, certainly training, safety training is a big part of what we also provide um, and as part of the funding package uh, in terms of dividers between uh, segmenting where the driver is versus uh, the riders. Uh, I don't know that that's an actual part of it. I don't believe it is. Um, but that's a conversation uh, that we can have with our federal partners. Uh, I, I just would urge you to do that in light of some of the issues that have occurred okay. in the last year within the um, non-MTA systems in, in Westchester. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, I would like to, <clears throat> to take this time to talk with you, Commissioner, about a very important local project that's in western New York. And I know since you took office as Commissioner on July 2nd of 2015, you have traveled the state and you are very familiar with upstate, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I know you also know that the governor has prioritized western New York, and as a result of the governor's efforts, we've had a real rebirth, we've had a renewal, new hope, new vitality. Our economy is growing in Erie County again. We've seen progress along the southern tier. And one of the projects that is very important that community leaders, business leaders, labor leaders um, have gotten behind is finishing Route 219. This is a project, route, route 219. It's a project that has been ongoing for many, many years and for decades, as a matter of fact. And up until 2010, we were making great progress. And it's been stalled, unfortunately, ever since then. I know you've been busy today um, getting ready, but I wanted to point out, in the Buffalo News this morning, there was an excellent editorial about completing 219. And the Buffalo News is calling on the state and the governor to seek funds through the FAST Act that you pointed out earlier, the Federal right. um, Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, and that there will be funds available. And what the Buffalo News is hoping, what leaders in Western New York are hoping, what I'm hoping, what our assemblymen are hoping, is that we can finally start to make progress again on Route 219. In 2010, there was, it was a technological marvel. Zor Valley is 500 feet deep in some spots, and there was a bridge um, as part of the new construction of 219 right. that was completed, a double bridge. Um, and during that construction, unfortunately, the state, the state administration at that time tried to divert $86 million away from that project. Because of outcry, we were able to restore that. The bridge was completed. So now the, the roadway goes down to Ashford. Um, but we'd like to get it started again. And what the Buffalo News points out, and by the way, this is a 1,500 mile bi national interstate that would open up new opportunities for Western New York as far as trade, as far as commerce, as far as logistics. And it would provide many, many, many good paying construction jobs. And it would only add and enhance what the governor's been able to achieve for Western New York. So what we're hoping is, is that we can finally get this jump started. The other states have made great progress. Maryland, for example, just improved funding for a two and a half mile interchange in Maryland. There are 200 miles left in Pennsylvania that need to be completed. But the great news is, is that Pennsylvania has committed dollars for the study process on 219. So if we can get this Toronto to Miami route open, I think it would bode well. And it would actually enhance, because as you know, we have the throughway system that runs from east to west, right. or west to east, if you're from western New York. Um, and we have Interstate 86 
that also runs from west to east. And so this would provide us with a strategic placement on the map, really put Western New York on the map. And as we continue to grow our economy, continue to focus on growing manufacturing jobs, this would be enormous for Western New York. So what we're hoping is, is that um, the governor, you, will work with the president, with the federal government, to secure the funds. And what we're looking at is Section 12. We've been coming from the north down to the south. But what we'd like to do is complete Section 12, which is a, it's, um, a couple mile stretch. And it would go from Interstate 86 to just north of Salamanca. There are a few reasons why that's important. One is Dresser Rand is one of the largest employers in the region in the southern tier, certainly the largest employer in the city of Olean. They manufacture huge compressors, and transporting those huge compressors mm -hmm. is always a challenge. Um, if we are able to finish the 219 where they run into some uh, snags now, they would be uh, better able to ship these compressors, go up to the port up in Buffalo and ship them that way. And that would actually help the company enormously. So what we're hoping for, what we're pushing for, and what I'd like to work with you on is finding a way to work to get 219 going again. I think this is an enormous opportunity that has presented itself for the state, for Western New York, through this fast funding. And I know that there's $16 billion available for New York State. And I also know Senator Chuck Schumer has prioritized uh, having money available for our state's highways and bridges through, that, through those funds. So um, hopefully we can work together with leaders from Western New York to come to a conclusion. And I just wanted to put that on your radar screen. Okay. And hopefully we can get the um, funding put in place the environmental studies completed, work, this, work with the Seneca Nation of Indians because this section would actually go through their territory, but I also think this would be something that would be quite beneficial for the nation also. So, um, and I'll, I will circle up with my folks and then I will call you when I can figure out a process, but do you, uh, is there an issue with going through the nation on that? Or are they open to this type of I've work? met with the nation um, several times and in fact um, met with them this morning and I can't speak on behalf of the president of the tribal council, but um, counselors, but I will say that there are discussions that could be had. Uh, certainly it's beneficial for the nation and certainly it's beneficial for the state. And I, they seem to be open to having that discussion with the state. Okay. I'll, I'll take a look at it and I'll give your office a call. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. Assemblyman Scoofus. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I want to first thank your Region 8 team for their exemplary work. Uh, they've been uh, real true partners with my office over the past three years. Um, you know, I'm all for parity. I do have a major concern with the debate uh, on parity, though, that has evolved or, I guess, actually devolved into this upstate, downstate uh, divide. Uh, and I say that because there are some areas of the state that don't fit nicely into upstate or downstate here in New York. And uh, in particular, the Hudson Valley represent Orange and Rockland counties. Uh, you know, if you ask, um, you know, someone from the five boroughs, anything north of Riverdale is upstate. If you ask someone from North Country, they'll laugh at you if you try and say Orange and Rockland yeah. counties are in upstate. <laughs> so one of my concerns is that uh, as part of this DOT capital program and how the money is divvied up into each of the DOT regions, those in the Hudson Valley, particularly Orange and Rockland counties, um, west of the Hudson, uh, we will somehow be penalized uh, or be given a disproportionately less amount of money that comes through this five-year capital program um, as a result of uh, really the crumbs that we get from the MTA capital program. So I'm hoping that you can respond to that and perhaps hopefully allay my fears. Yeah, well, I know there's always been a lot of conversation about, you know, who, who gets more, who gets less. Um, you know, DOT historically does an assessment of the system across the state, regardless of where you are, and really looks at usage, uh, traffic flows, counts, conditions, etc. So, uh, you know, I, I say historically DOT has always been fair in doing that, 
and I want to assure you going forward that we will be uh, as well. Uh, because I did, again, I recognize, you know, uh, you, when you have a certain amount of pie, uh, and it's got to do a lot of things that people, rightfully so, are advocating always for more. But we try to take uh, kind of a holistic view as to how we can meet our responsibility, which is to keep the system safe, because that is the most important element of what we do, but also to support the locals so they can keep the system on a local level safe as well, because that's the most important thing they can do also.